so you guys look pretty bad. We do. We we do look bad. Yeah. And your record's kind of bad. Record is kind of bad. Record's kind of bad. The stats are, the stats are bad. Stats are absolutely bad for sure. You nailed that one. And the advanced analytics are, well, really bad. Oh yeah, that is bad, bad, like bad. <laughs> and lastly, your prospects also look kind of bad. Tough, tough, tough start for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, the bad, bad. It's bad. So you guys might be bad. Yeah. Yeah, I think we might be bad. Oh, I kind of thought you were going to do the whole, no, it's just a slump thing or argument. Nope, I uh, I genuinely think that we might be bad, which is just really bad news for the rest of the league. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone's going to be really pumped about you being bad. Yeah, sure. No, you, you say that now, but what happens in January when the Bruins are 16 points? Out of the playoffs. Uh, I don't know. You, you sell? Sell. Sell. Did you know that the average size of a player on the Boston Bruins is six foot two, two 211 pounds? That's the, now, that's the average. Meaning, there are quite a few players much, much bigger than that. So? So, I urge you. To enjoy the Boston Bruins being bad while you can. Because when it becomes clear that we can't win anything, by all that is holy, I promise you, we will make sure that no one else can either. This took a dark turn. What's the matter? Which would your smile go? The Boston Bruins are bad. Come on, get your digs in. Make your jokes. Now's your chance. You know, I... I think I'm just gonna go. Yeah, sure. Oh, hey. Yeah? I'll see you Saturday. Yeah. You guys aren't actually gonna start doing that, right? No, 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 probably not. I just gotta have some fun somewhere in this season, right? Low quality fans of a high quality moons team. That is not a dub. And I am here to tell you, to tell you that you are forgiven. And I hope you'll forgive me too. You have to forgive me. I'm finally back, right? I'm, I'm back. I just got back literally late, late last night um, from Arizona, which was really cool. Now's not the time to talk about it. What I do want to talk about is how you, you're forgiven. You are forgiven for losing faith for like 12 hours. It's okay. It's okay. Because frankly, I watched as much of that game as I could in the airport. And then I came home and watched a bit more. And I gotta say, losing faith seems like a really easy path. It seems like something we could just be like, you know what? I'm going to save myself some feelings, save myself some hurt. I'll lose faith. I'll, I'll get real casual about this. I won't care. We both know, you and I, that you're going to care. You're going to care. And you can get negative, but you know I hate that. You know, it's not fun being negative. If you don't believe in it, it's like, then you're just bitter and you're negative about every good thing that happens. And the fun just gets sucked out of it. Just gone. You're forgiven. It's okay. It's okay to lose a little faith. We just got shut out by the Philadelphia Flyers. A team we haven't lost in regulation to on our home ice in 13 years. That's a long time. 2011. Something else happened in 2011. Yeah, we're, we're it's straws, man. We're grasping where we can. It's okay. Because not only did you get shut out by this team, this statistically bottom three defense, <laughs> and before last night, a bottom three goaltender analytically, not only did you get shut out by them, you wasted a stellar performance from your backup goaltender, which you cannot expect every time he starts. He's a backup, and he's not 
Uh, well, I'm not going to insult him after that performance. He was awesome. Corpus Allo was great last night. Great. Your power play, once again, hemorrhaged momentum. You had a five on three, basically, to start the game. Awful. Off awful. Awful. You refuse to adjust it, too. God, you refuse to adjust a power play that ranks in, like, the bottom eight of the league, something like that. I'm going to look that up in a second. Just awful. Terrible. There's so many reasons to watch this game. A game where, technically, you probably deserve to win. You got goal lead. You can't get goal lead by Erson. That's not how that works. You get goal lead by Vasilevsky. Hellebuck, Shishterkin, Soros, Swayman. But you don't get goalied by a guy who cannot maintain a 900 save percentage. You can't, that's not goalied. That's you have no finish. Am I making arbitrary rules right now? Absolutely. I'm allowed to do that on my own YouTube channel. This is the pinnacle of a game that no matter how good you looked during it, you're allowed to completely overreact after you've lost it. It's the pinnacle of that game. If we were Leafs fans, well, we actually probably sound a lot like Leafs fans right now. I don't even think we can, I, I don't even think I could dunk on them at this point. The team looks terrible. Again, because I was on my phone, on a flight, all this kind of stuff, uh, I, I didn't get to do the, the game notes and the breakdown and everything, but we're going to do another snapshot of the team that's going to get probably a little, little sadder right now. Uh, I do I do want to make a point, though, uh, about the Grand Canyon. Awesome. Grand Canyon's dope. Huge hole. It's a huge hole. Really big. Uh, I do love how no guardrails, no steps, nothing like that. Not that I expected them. I'm not, I'm not that dumb. But seriously, you walk down the side of this cliff, and they're like, good luck, and you just go. So the, the Grand Canyon was really cool. I'm not going to talk about the trip. But I'm going to talk about the game. I just wanted to say that. Like, comment, subscribe. Nailed it. A snapshot of the team. The Boston Bruins, right now, are bottom 10 in the league in power play, which is 25th, goals scored per game, which is 25th, and almost bottom 10 in goals allowed per game at 21st. Expected goals for percentage at 5-on-5, five five, so at even strength, our expected goals for percentage, I'm going to explain this because it's still early in the season that some people might not know, that's basically saying... Do you, are you expected to score more than your opponent? Usually that percentage is somewhere between like 43% and 57%. Somewhere along those lines. Like if you're in the 60 percentile, you that line is elite. They're unbelievable. So the expected goals for percentage is small margins, but it does translate when across a larger body of work to winning versus losing. So our expected goals for percentage is negative, as you would expect, and it ranks 23rd in the league at 5-on-5. Five five. Scoring chances for 26th. High danger chances created 28th. This is all through natural stat trick, and this is all even strength. High danger save percentage 28th. Shooting percentage 22nd. Expected goals for percentage on the power play. 27. That's weird. I just looked this up. That's right. We are second in expected goals on the power play. Second in the league. We have the second most expected goals on the power play. Now, there's a lot of penalties in our game, so I'm sure it's playing a role. How do we rank 27th in expected goals for percentage? And we rank second in expected goals. Well, we don't score on the power play, so throw that out. It's because we give up so many shorthanded chances that although our power play, which again, shocking to me, analytically, should be scoring a bunch, I guess, they also should be scored on a bunch because we turn it over for fast breaks all the time. Hi, McAvoy. Hi, buddy. And Marshand, actually. Marshand does it, too. I can't just pick on McAvoy. I do want McAvoy off the power play. 
We're going to talk about that other stat in a second. But 27th in expected goals for percentage of the power play. And our shooting percentage on the power play is 26th, which also kind of answers some questions that we're getting to. The good stuff is we're 13th in expected goals allowed. So defensively, we're 13th. I guess that's good. I hope that gets better. We are second in expected goals for on the power play, which again blew my mind. But our finishing is non-existent. So there's that. And we're 14th of the penalty kill. Again, that's not good, but it's better than the other numbers. I'll take it. The power play thing befuddles me because it looks terrible, but apparently it's creating high danger chances at a high rate, but no one can finish. I still think it needs a change. The fact that we're 10 games in and we have made zero adjustments to a power play that ranks 27th, <laughs> that's not great. <laughs> that's really not great. Uh, I don't understand where Monty's coming from for a lot of this. Maybe because the Bruins have their analytics department. Maybe the analytics department is looking at Monty going, hey, we are second in chance creation and expected goals on the power play. We're second in the league. We're just not getting the puck luck. And so Monty's like, we're going to stick with it. I... Eye test isn't a thing, but it's kind of a thing. Doesn't look that good. And no one can finish. I'm still, like, I'm still in that zone where I said 15 games. A lot of stuff has to get shaken out through 15 games. So we're sticking with some stuff that we know doesn't work. The power play has been brutal for over a year. It might be, maybe, it's not just the personnel. Maybe it's where you're deploying the personnel. Maybe it's... How you have this structured and what you're attempting to do on the power play. No adjustments at all. One of the reasons that Monty's seat is probably getting a little warmer. Do I think he's getting close to getting fired? No. But he's certainly not close to getting extended either. There's a couple of noticeable trends that I want to talk to you guys about that I think you're going to find super interesting this first one. There are currently nine Bruins players. I say currently because Tufty was part of this and got moved out, but Tufty's numbers weren't high anyway. But there are currently nine Bruins players that when they are on the ice, meaning this isn't them personally, but while they are on the ice, the team has an expected goals for percentage above 50%, meaning they are, by the analytics, should be outscoring their opponents while they're on the ice. In fact, these nine are the only players above 47.09 percent it's a little bit of a drop off 47 percent on expected goals for percentage is a sign of a, like a bad line like you are struggling there take a moment pause the video guess a few of these names you're gonna get the fourth line obviously right past that just just throw some throw some guesses out there it's forwards and defensemen all right i'm gonna let you pause it but we're gonna move on well here they are in order from highest expected goals for percentage while they're on the ice to the lowest. Patra, 69.35%. Kepke, 63.96%. Beecher, 58.2%. Zadorov, 54.39%. Kostelik, 53.89%. Geeky, 51.39%. Lindholm, 51.14%. And then Peak and Brazil are just under 51% few things to say about this. McAvoy and Carlo have not been good yet this year. They are not on this list. Now remember, these are all the players that while they're on the ice, the Bruins analytically are outplaying their opponents. Keep that in mind. McAvoy and Carlo not on this list. They've not been good yet this year. I don't think that's a hot take. But they consistently get very difficult matchups, and I do expect them to improve. I'm confident in that because we've seen what they are capable of. Neither one of them has fallen out of their prime. Where it's going to get worked out. I'm really confident in those two. Peak squeaking in makes sense to me, as he's been fine. Brizzo squeaking in because he plays a simple game and gets to the net front makes sense to me as well. No complaints there. I think Peak, as far as defensemen go, just third pairing, good enough, not the cause for a lot of goals against. I'm, I'm really fine with what Peak's bringing. Hampus Lindholm, I should have specified, that was not Elias Lindholm. Hampus Lindholm, uh, makes sense to me. He's looked very good. I actually expected him to be higher on this list. And Zadorov at almost, well, at above 
That is genuinely surprising, but he does spend a good portion of time getting those third pair matches. He's great at getting the puck to the net from the blue line. There is a lot to like, and I think his game is improving, but he clearly is best suited for that third pairing role with the occasional, obviously, penalty killing and things of that nature, which makes you worry about the fact that you pay him $5 million a year. But this isn't about that. He's on the team. I got to stop harping on that. That contract sucks. It's going to suck the whole time. But he's on the team. He's a Boston Bruin. It is what it is. So that answers a few of them. Fourth line has been excellent. Duh. That covers everyone on this list other than Morgan Geeky and Matthew Patra. Geeky. A huge surprise to be listed as one of our better players on On Ice Impact there. Where when he's on the ice, our line is consistently pushing pace towards the other zone and creating better chances than they're allowing. That's surprising to me. Until you see at even strength that he's been outscored, his lines have been outscored four to zero, and they possess the lowest chance creation out of this list by a mile. He just has a very positive impact defensively, which is great, but it's more reason that he belongs in the bottom six. And right now we have enough really good defensively guys in the bottom six that Geeky's about to get benched. It's been that bad that Geeky might get benched soon. He's a black hole offensively and defensively very good. But so is the whole fourth line and pretty much the whole third line. Geeky has got to shake off of what, like, I know I rag on the guy a lot. And I, all of last year, call him the black hole, everything. But... You, you can't be a straight negative impact guy like he has been across half the ice. It's been so unbelievably brutal for Geeky so far this season. He doesn't have a point yet. It's just, it's bad. It's bad. We won't harp too much on that. Matthew Potra leads everybody. This comes with an asterisk, though, or maybe a couple of them, but he has an almost 65% shift start rate in the offensive zone. That, out of this list is a huge difference from the second closest, who is at around 58%. That 7% is a is a big chunk there. And that's Brazil who has the 58%. What that means is they're starting the majority, large majority, of their shifts in the offensive zone. Of course, they're going to be creating more chances, or at least you'd very much hope that they would. That aside, high danger chances are 14 to 3 while Patra is on the ice. The on-ice shooting percentage for the team, while Patra is on the ice, is 2.33%. The only players with a lower team shooting percentage while they're on the ice is Morgan Geeky, 0%. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, his high danger chances are 15 to 12. Brad Marchand, 2.17%, and Charlie Coyle, 2.17%. Uh, Marchand's high danger chances are 19 to 23 meaning Bruins get 19 to his 23. These are total amounts through these games. And uh, Charlie Coyle's high danger chances, 16 to 25. That second line has been in the negative quite a bit, as you can tell by the high danger chances. I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you that Matthew Patra is a top line winger or center and deserves all this ice time and yada, yada, yada. He gets abused. He oftentimes looks hurt after every single game. He definitely needs to work on either beefing up or, my preferred, is get harder to hit. Get your head up a little bit. Patra has a bad habit of getting caught in these corners, and it hurts for him. It hurts bad. But when he's on the ice, again, a lot of offensive zone starts that needs to be taken into account. The team's better when he's on the ice. And right now, actually, I'm curious about this, how, what his ice time average is. Because I believe it sits behind quite a few players he got 13 minutes last night 13 i'm not sure if there's another player on this team who has been as impacted by his line mates being unable to finish a chance as patra has patra should have had two assists in the first period last night every time he plays through a full game i'm sitting there going how did he go with no points he set up chance after chance after chance Unfortunately, a lot of them go to Pavel Zaka, oddly enough, and Zaka just has zero finish, which we know, king of ping, it's nothing new, but Patra is putting up real numbers, analytically, 
I'm just hoping the dam breaks at some point. But with how bad the first line has been, I'm going to say something controversial. It's been so <laughs> caved by their opponents. I might add Patra to it. I don't know. I really don't. I just... It's been so bad. An adjustment needs to be made at some point here. Again, they're trying to give Lindholm and Pasternak and, and Marsha and Orzaka, who is on, ever is on that left, some time to figure it out. But this is bad. Predictably, too. We talked about this uh, Elias Lindholm deal. We really did. All off season. This is pretty predictable. Hopefully, they shake out of it. It just doesn't look great right now. This next point piggybacks off of that a little bit. But the top six is truly a mess. It's truly a mess. This team statistically deserved a win last night. I don't care at this point. The Bruins have one line, one line, that ranks in the top 90 of four lines with at least 20 minutes of five-on-five -five play in ex expected goals for percentage. It's very wordy, and I apologize for that. But obviously, if you are going to guess what the best line in expected goals percentage is for the Boston Bruins, you would guess, that's right, the fourth line. We're doing a Dora the Explorer thing here. It's the fourth line. The third has too many iterations to it, so they're not even listed because they don't have 20 minutes on ice of five-on-five -five play time, which is 10 games of the season is a little surprising. But the top six are both past 90. There's three different iterations that have 20 minutes played. I believe it's the Marchand, uh, Lindholm, Pasta, the Zaka, Lindholm, Pasta, and then I think it's Marchand, Coil, Geeky, oddly enough. Maybe Briz... So, no, I think it's geeky. Either way, all three of those are 91st or worse. I mean, firmly in the negative. That's out of like 140 teams. It's that bad. But you just continue to do the same thing, particularly with that top line. Brazil had an, a positive impact on, line, on the second line analytically last night. He does slow that line down at 5-on-5, five five, but he has had a positive impact. If you want to keep that line together, fine. Go for it. Whatever. Let's see what happens against a team that's not Philadelphia. Uh, no, again, you still couldn't score with it, but that's something. But you can't have a top line that only has positive numbers when playing Montreal or Philly. Because those are the only two games that that positive line, that, that top line, has not gotten absolutely dog walked. They get dog walked by every single other team we play. The top line is abysmal at five on five and if you won't change personnel then you desperately need to find a way to change play style because hovering around 500 isn't even sustainable like this that's the thing is this team has gotten lucky in some of its wins this is not sustainable to even be okay the top line has to be able to win some matchups obviously this is super doom and gloom it's just where we are at the season at this point. I worry about underlying numbers that say, hey, this isn't getting better. In fact, it looks like it's getting worse. And although I know not everyone's a huge analytics person, the eye test kind of agrees with you there. The top line doesn't look good. Elias Lindholm, although he's winning faceoffs now, is certainly not making the big difference for actual playstyle at even strength. And that line spends way more time getting caved in than they do actually bringing it to the other team, which is what you want your top line to do. The weird thing is the options aren't that great. Right now, our options are Tyler Johnson, who's on a PTO, injected him in the lineup, forces Geeky out. I don't know how much that actually helps the team, but Geeky is the one who gets benched with that, which is crazy to say out loud. But I can't I can't move anyone for the fourth line out. I can't move Pacho out. I can't move Brazo out. Trent Frederick, although Trent Frederick hasn't really showed up yet this season either. Who else are you moving? Tyler Johnson from Morgan Geeky. How much does that move the needle? Uh, Lysel or Merkulov? Neither one have had stellar starts to the year in Providence, but still be, might be worth just adding them in and injecting that speed. Um, finishing ability Merkulov has. I, I don't know. Just something in that middle six. Or we could suffer. Then just keep doing the same thing. Not a lot of options. Sticking the course is really suffering, but it is an option at least for a few more games, and you're hoping that something clicks, particularly for that first line. But there has to be, at some point, some sort of change. 
whether that comes from the team itself and how they want to play, their chemistry, their ability to connect. But right now, we're too slow. We get beat to way too many pucks. And the finishing ability is non-existent. It's, when's the last time we saw someone get, like, we beat a goalie cleanly? It just doesn't look good from top to bottom right now. Not tr not fair. Not fair. Fourth line still looks good. I let's be honest. But there's a lot to get very, very frustrated about. The good news is I'm back. We're going to dive back into the regular schedule. We're going to actually have these videos up the night of the games. We're going to have proper skits done. All sorts of good stuff. I'm trying to work on some other things too. It's just time is the resource that I tend not to have, but I do appreciate you guys not being too upset with me about this. Uh, and if you are very upset with me, I get it. That's all right. I'm not going to argue with you. Go Bees! Go Bees! Of course, we have to give a huge thank you to everyone who's supporting this channel, especially the high-quality inspectors, our top-line tier members, Chris and Erica, Jeff with a G, Tommy Braga, the Bugman, Roland22, GD Viperworks, Len Cruz, Moonlighter TV, Brock Nope, Han Slomo, Coach D, The Atomic Lizard, Bradley Johnson, Aaron Adams, Brett Arney, Pincent, Adam Ella, and Nick Zatrulo. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel. You're all studs and studettes. And of course, a huge thank you. To the Stallions, our all-star tier members, Joel, Dutes42, Heil E. Coyote, Darren Woodbury, Abraxion, John Kirk, Michael DiPaolo, Wolf Warrior, Vinny, Adrian Winter, Tupton D. Tashi, Nightmare Eco, Bruin Smash, DeKingery, The Only Newts, A Tasty Snack, and Jeremy. You are all absolute legends. I appreciate you eternally. And as usual, go bees!